In Buddhism, bodhicitta, enlightenment mind, is the mind that strives toward awakening, empathy, and compassion for the benefit of all sentient beings. Topic Etymology. Etymologically, the word is a combination of the Sanskrit words body and cheetah. Body means awakening or enlightenment. Cheetah derives from the Sanskrit root cit and means that which is conscious, i.e., mind or consciousness. Bodhicitta may be translated as awakening mind or mind of enlightenment topic <inaudible> spontaneity bodhicitta is a spontaneous wish to attain enlightenment motivated by great compassion for all sentient beings accompanied by a falling away of the attachment to the illusion of an inherently existing self the mind of great compassion and bodhicitta motivates one to attain enlightenment buddhahood as quickly as possible and benefit infinite sentient beings through their emanations and other skillful means bodhicitta is a felt need to replace others suffering with bliss since the ultimate end of suffering is nirvana, bodhicitta necessarily involves a motivation to help others to awaken to find body. A person who has a spontaneous realization or motivation of bodhicitta is called a bodhisattva. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Levels. Different schools may demonstrate alternative understandings of bodhicitta. Nyoshal Kenpo Rinpoche and Surya Das, both Nyingma masters of the non-sectarian rhyme movement, distinguish between relative and absolute or ultimate bodhicitta. Relative bodhicitta is a state of mind in which the practitioner works for the good of all beings as if it were their own. Absolute bodhicitta is the wisdom of shunyata, sunyata, a Sanskrit term often translated as emptiness, though the alternatives vast expanse or openness, or spaciousness, probably convey the idea better to Westerners. The concept of sunyata in Buddhism also implies freedom from attachments and from fixed ideas about the world and how it should be. Some bodhicitta practices emphasize the absolute, e.g., vipayana, while others emphasize the relative, e.g., metta. But both aspects are seen in all Mahayana practice as essential to enlightenment, especially in the Tibetan practices of Tonglen and Lojong. Without the absolute, the relative can degenerate into pity and sentimentality, whereas the absolute without the relative can lead to nihilism and lack of desire to engage other sentient beings for their benefit. In his book Words of My Perfect Teacher, the Tibetan Buddhist teacher Patrul Rinpoche describes three degrees of bodhicitta, the way of the king, who primarily seeks his own benefit but who recognizes that his benefit depends crucially on that of his kingdom and his subjects. The path of the boatman, who ferries his passengers across the river and simultaneously, of course, ferries himself as well, and finally that of the shepherd, who makes sure that all his sheep arrive safely ahead of him and places their welfare above his own. <inaudible> <inaudible> Origins and development Use in early Mahayana Describing use of the term bodhicitta in Tibetan Buddhism, Paul Williams writes that the term is used differently in early Mahayana works, referring to a state of mind in which a bodhisattva carries out actions. We are describing here the late systematized Indo-Tibetan Mahayana. It seems that in the relatively early Ugraparipcha Sutra, for example, the bodhicitta is a much vaguer concept, more, a certain state of mind, in which a bodhisattva acts Natiya 2003a, 148. Pagel points out that many Mahayana sutras, including the Bodhisattvapitaka, hold that the arising of bodhicitta is not simply a static thing that occurs just at the beginning of the bodhisattva path. Rather it is continuously retaken and evolves through practice. 
Topic: <laughs> Late Mahayana texts. Among the most important later source texts on bodhicitta, used by traditions of Tibetan Buddhism, are Santideva's A Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life c. 700 CE. Thogmi Zangpo's 37 Practices of a Bodhisattva 12th century CE. Langri Tangpa's Eight Verses for Training the Mind c. 1100 CE, and Geshe Chekhawa training the mind in seven points in the 12th century CE. Topic: <laughs> Practice. Mahayana Buddhism propagates the bodhisattva ideal, in which the six perfections are being practiced. Arousing bodhicitta is part of this bodhisattva ideal. Topic. Ideal In Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhism, the goal of Buddhist practice is primarily to be reborn infinite numbers of times to liberate all those other beings still trapped in samsara. Parameters <inaudible> 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 Mahayana Buddhism teaches that the broader motivation of achieving one's own enlightenment, in order to help all sentient beings, is the best possible motivation one can have for any action, whether it be working in one's vocation, teaching others, or even making an incense offering. The six perfections parameters of Buddhism only become true perfections when they are done with the motivation of bodhicitta. Thus, the action of giving SKT, dana, can be done in a mundane sense, or it can be a paramita if it is conjoined with bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is the primary positive factor to be cultivated. <laughs> Cultivation The Mahayana tradition provides specific methods for the intentional cultivation of both absolute and relative bodhicitta. This cultivation is considered to be one of the most difficult aspects of the path to complete awakening. Practitioners of the Mahayana make it their primary goal to develop a genuine, uncontrived bodhicitta which remains within their mind streams continuously without having to rely on conscious effort. Among the many methods for developing uncontrived bodhicitta given in Mahayana teachings are Contemplation of the four immeasurables Brahmaviharas, Immeasurable loving-kindness Immeasurable compassion Karuna, Immeasurable joy in the good fortune of others Mudita, and Immeasurable equanimity Apexa. The practice of the parameters generosity, patience, virtue, effort, meditation, and insight. The taking and sending tonglen practice, in which one takes in the pain and suffering of others with the inhalation and sends them love, joy, and healing with the exhalation, and the lojong mind training practices of which tonglen forms a part. Viewing all other sentient beings as having been our mothers in infinite past lives, and feeling gratitude for the many occasions on which they have taken care of us. <laughs> Two practice lineages Tibetan Buddhists maintain that there are two main ways to cultivate bodhicitta, the seven causes and effects. That originates from Maitreya and was taught by Atisha, and exchanging self and others, taught by Shantideva and originally by Manjushri. According to Tsongkhapa, the seven causes and effects are thus recognizing all beings as your mothers, recollecting their kindness, the wish to repay their kindness, love, great compassion, wholehearted resolve. Bodhicitta, according to Pabongka Rinpoche the second method consists of the following meditations How self and others are equal Contemplating the many faults resulting from self-cherishing Contemplating the many good qualities resulting from cherishing others The actual contemplation on the interchange of self and others With these serving as the basis, the way to meditate on giving and taking tonglen.
Topic: Universality. The practice and realization of bodhicitta are independent of sectarian considerations, since they are fundamentally a part of the human experience. Bodhisattvas are not only recognized in the Theravada school of Buddhism, but in all other religious traditions and among those of no formal religious tradition. The present 14th Dalai Lama, for instance, regarded Mother Teresa as one of the greatest modern bodhisattvas. See also Bodhisattva vow Bodhisattva precepts Consciousness Buddhism Notes <laughs>